Hey everybody, it's Joe Martucci here at Press of Atlantic City. It is time for the Something in the Air podcast. And we are going all the way down to Florida for this episode. We're talking to Nick Underwood. He is a hurricane hunter. And I love this episode because... It is the peak of hurricane season here, not only in South Jersey, but all across the Atlantic Hurricane Basin. And this guy um, has really kind of brought hurricane hunting to the forefront of social media, really active on Twitter, over 18,000 followers. So we're talking with him. We're talking about how a kid from West Virginia is now working directly with the tropics, uh, talking about what an average day is like for him, talking a little bit about his Twitter account and stick to the end because he promised he is going to tell us where north south and maybe central jersey exists that's coming up right here on the something in the air podcast all right it is time we are here with the guy who wfh means not only work from home but work from hurricane his words not mine we are welcoming on nick underwood nick Thanks for being on here today. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Um, so, all right, so let me just start off with this. Last year's hurricane season was blank. Uh, last year's hurricane season was intense. Uh, intense. Uh, obviously, okay, we had a, a record number of storms. Uh, our office, we were flying pretty much constantly from July to November, uh, and there really wasn't a lot of breaks built in there. So it was it was intense for us. Yeah, uh, record-breaking hurricane season, most number of named storms, I believe the most number of hurricanes in one month, I think September of 10, I think that was a record as well. Uh, We went into the Greek alphabet, in fact, I think we destroyed the Greek alphabet with how many storms we had, because now we're not doing that anymore, which I think is a good thing, you could chime in on that if you like, Um, but it, this year so far, we're recording this on August 6th. The last tropical system we had was Elsa, which came through here in South Jersey on July 9th. So, you know, we've been kind of eerily quiet. Um, how's it been over the last month for you? Just with, you know, essentially nothing really, I guess, with field missions, you're not going out to any storms, but just over the past couple of weeks when it's been relatively quiet in the tropics. Uh, it's still been busy for us. So even when we're not out flying a system, we're at the hangar doing maintenance, uh, putting new science systems in. We're, I, I, as an aerospace engineer, I'm supporting the other aircraft that NOAA operates that don't just do hurricane missions, but are uh, up in the Northeast uh, studying right whales or up in Alaska or really all across the country, just supporting different missions. So we've done some flight test stuff. We've done systems integration, maintenance. So even though there's not a tropical system, we're all staying busy. Gotcha. Um, and the peak of hurricane season is, you know, right around early September here. Um, Noah's forecast is for an above average hur- or average to above average hurricane season. Um, Nick, so you know, you're an aerospace engineer, so you're not a meteorologist, but I have to imagine you have some interest in weather being that you're working for Noah and flying into these storms. Even, even though I'm not classically trained as a meteorologist, you certainly pick up a lot of stuff you know, being in this job. And I've, I've been here for, it'll be five years uh, at the end of this month. So, uh, you know, I, I work with the meteorologists all the time when we're deployed out in the field. Uh, they're an essential part of our crews on the aircraft. And so there's plenty of opportunities to talk to them and to learn from them and to to really get a sense of, of how these things develop and, and what's going on. Gotcha. Would you say your favorite weather is tropical systems? <laughs> uh and I know that, that, that that's a loaded word, favor in the weather. Right, 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 right. Uh, you know, tropical systems are certainly uh, interesting and exciting. Um, I've spent a lot of time in them over the last five years. Uh, but I think my favorite weather system is just, you know, a calm 70, 70 75 degree day, a little bit of wind, nice and okay. sunny, a little bit of clouds. Okay. You know, okay. That's, All right, that's fine. I think meteorologists sometimes overthink the weather thing. Like we think like a day, like for example, today here, it's going to be in the eighties and sunny. We're like, ah, it's kind of a boring day, you know, but you know, we like a little excitement, but you know, to you, you're taking it very purely. You like the nice weather and you live in Florida. So you get a couple of months of that seventies and sunshine during the uh, winter months here, but you're originally from West Virginia. So, you know, 
you're a, you're in a landlocked state, right? And now now you're dealing with tropical weather all the time. So just kind of growing up, and I, I know we talked a little bit about your interest in weather, but what was it like growing up in West Virginia? And then is it kind of interesting to now be in Florida where like tropical systems are your number one weather player when it comes to severe weather and you're in these storms too? It's, it's certainly uh, a place in a career that I never imagined that I would be in as a kid. So I grew up in Southern West Virginia, mountains, uh, trees, you know, the ocean is a couple hours away. And uh, I loved growing up there. But as a kid, I really got interested in space and rockets and airplanes. And so I pursued aerospace engineering as a career. And then my first job out of college, I was working for uh, Naval Air Systems Command as a flight test engineer. And I only did that for about a year before I found the SNOAA job. And really, I just wanted to do something with my degree that was science focused. I didn't really care where it was or what it was. And it's, it's really been exciting because I didn't really have a super interest in tropical weather. I didn't even know that hurricane hunting was a job a, a couple of years ago, uh, but now I'm so deep into it and, and I love it so much. It's, it's tough to imagine doing anything else right now. I have to say, I feel like you're the the voice of the hurricane hunters just being so active, you know, specifically on social media. And of course, don't, you're doing don't tell our media. public affairs folks that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, well, we'll bleep that part out. Um, but uh, but no, I mean, I, I've seen you all around, you know, and I think you're bringing some light to, you know, people who aren't that familiar with it. And, you know, you're probably inspiring the next generation of, you know, what could be hurricane hunters. But, you know, so my question is, you know, what is the process to actually like get up in the plane and fly and you know, record and be in the center of the storm? So much goes into it. Uh, so first, there's got to be something out there to go fly. So we've got our good friends at the National Hurricane Center that are constantly tracking the systems as they work their way up through the Gulf of Mexico or across the Atlantic. And once we get tasked to go fly a storm, we've got two types of aircraft that we use. We have our four engine propeller planes, which are our WP3D Orions. Those are the planes that you see actually inside the storm. Uh, they fly between eight to 12,000 feet above the water and just are crashing through the eye wall and the rain bands and everything else. And then we have our high altitude hurricane surveillance jet, uh, which we call Gonzo, that's flying up at 45,000 feet in front of, above and around the storms, getting that, that high altitude data that really sort of steers where these storms go. And so sometimes only uh, the P3s will get tasked, especially if it's more of a research focused mission. Uh, if it's something that is powerful and looks like it's going to cause a lot of damage or be a dangerous storm, then we'll definitely have both types of aircraft in the air. And before those aircraft take off, we've got maintainers on the ground who are taking good care of them and making sure that they're ready for us to go fly. And then the actual crew consists of usually about 12 to 15 people. And so that's pilots, a navigator, a flight director, which is our onboard meteorologist, uh, engineers like myself, electronics technicians, and then we'll also carry scientists from the National Hurricane Center with us. And so there's all of these folks on board doing their specific job, making sure that we're getting that data on the storms safely and effectively. And once we get up in the air, it's usually about an eight hour mission. So it's a full work day just in the air and we'll make our way out to the storm. We'll have a predefined uh, pattern where we're going to uh, launch drop sons, which is my job on the plane. Uh, and we'll also be collecting radar data and a bunch of other data all throughout the flight as well. So it's, it's a really complex process and, and so many uh, smart and talented people come together to, to make it all happen. You know, you said drop sons, and just elaborate for the people who may not be aware, what is a drop son and what's involved with that? So uh, a drop son is sort of like a weather balloon in reverse. So instead of tying it to a big balloon and letting it float up through the atmosphere to collect data for you, we have uh, the reverse of that. And so they have a little parachute that deploys. They're about the size of a Pringles can. And we launch them from the bottom of the aircraft. And as they float down, they're collecting temperature, pressure, humidity, wind speed, and wind direction data for us and sending all of that back to the aircraft. And then once they're finished collecting data, we'll send that data off to the National Hurricane Center so that the spaghetti plot models you see on TV of the 50 different tracks that a storm can take, uh, the data that feeds those models comes from the drop sons and the other instruments we have on the aircraft. 
Yeah. Um, and just to give a shout out to website, tropicaltidbits.com. They have a lot of that kind of information on there that they show your, you know, hurricane hunting data in, you know, I guess nearly real time. What, I don't know how familiar you are with them, but it, I think it's pretty real time, right? It, it, there's a little bit of a delay, but yeah, they're, they're tracking us pretty closely. So. Gotcha. Okay. You know, one thing you said that was interesting two minutes ago, you said to do so safely and effectively. And I think most people are saying hurricane safely, effectively doesn't mix. So <laughs> could we sort that out? What is the safe and effective way to be in a hurricane? And then my follow-up question to that is, do people get sick on that plane? Because I am not good with motion. <laughs> so I don't even know if I can make it up there. Uh, so the safely and effectively part, uh, Noah has been chasing hurricanes for a long time. And so there's a lot of knowledge that's been collected over the last few decades that we've built upon. And we've had uh, a lot of opportunities to learn how to best do this. And so the, effective, the effectiveness comes from working with our friends at the National Hurricane Center and the Hurricane Research Division, uh, predetermining those tracks that we're going to fly um, and making sure that we're making the best use of our time up there. And then the safety part of it comes from uh, years of experience of, of flying into these systems. Our crew is all uh, very highly trained to, to their job, especially the meteorologists on board, because they're the ones that are really our, our eyes in that storm that, that really keep us safe. So we've got on the P3s, we have three radar systems on board, uh, one in the nose, one under the fuselage of the aircraft and one in the tail. And those first two, the nose and the lower fuselage radar, those are really used to help us navigate through the storm and keep us out of some of the more violent parts of the storm. And uh, so the better they do that, the easier ride it's gonna be for everyone involved. And of course, um, our pilots and crews are, are trained very well as well. And uh, do people get sick on the plane? The answer is yes. Uh, I got sick on my very first flight into Hurricane Matthew in 2016. I was good for about two hours and then uh, proceeded to have probably the worst six hours of my life uh, because you're getting <laughs> bounced around and it's, it was dark outside for most of it. And I'm just sick and, and not having a good time. But these days, after you go through so much of this and after you, you learn sort of the tricks to, to keep yourself from getting sick, it becomes a lot easier uh, to, so I, I haven't gotten sick since then. All right. What, what are the tricks to not getting sick? I'm curious because I might need to take some cues from you. Uh, so the big thing is the big thing with motion sickness, uh, especially for me, is to not move my head too quickly. Uh, so even though my job on the plane is to prepare the drop sons and, and load them into the chute behind me, uh, I do it very methodically. And, you know, I'm not looking around and, you know, whipping my head around because that really can can. Uh, get your brain a little jostled. And then the other thing is that uh, for me at least, and I learned this from the pilots is to have a, a full stomach. So eat a, you know, a meal really? uh, before going on, because I guess there, there's less room in the, in the stomach for the acid to slosh around and everything. And then I'm constantly um, snacking throughout the flights as well. So, uh, and then the other thing is just being well rested and having a good night's sleep beforehand. That really helps too. That helps with anything though. That, I think that that's a good lesson for all of life, right? even uh, beyond uh, flying up in a plane here. So, you know, real quick, we have about a minute left in this segment. So obviously there's not hurricanes all year round. Um, so what are you doing during, you know, those quiet times, especially during the off season? So in, you know, your December, January, February, what, what, what's your working in the office kind of life like? Uh, so even in the off season, we're out flying missions. So we're not just active during hurricane season. We have projects all throughout the year and not just with our heavy aircraft, the P3s and the Gulfstream 4, but we've also got six light aircraft that are constantly on the road doing marine mammal surveys and climate studies and coastal mapping surveys and all of these different projects. And as an engineer, sometimes I get to deploy with those. And even, even the heavy aircraft have off-season projects as well, chasing atmospheric rivers and tornadoes across the Midwest and things like that. And sometimes I get to play a part in those. And then other times I'm just working in the office, um, doing aerospace engineering things. So uh, structures, thermodynamics, aerodynamics, just helping new science systems 
integrated onto our aircraft so that we can go out and collect more data for the scientists that want to work with us. Awesome. All right. Well, good first half here. We're going to come back in just a little bit. We're going to talk more about his life here at NOAA. Uh, we're going to talk about his Twitter game. And we're also going to talk about his map, which I've heard a lot about between North Central and South Jersey. You said it's correct. So stay tuned for that. This is the Something in the Air podcast. We are back with the Something in the Air podcast, new episodes, first and third Wednesdays of every month here, brought to you by the Press of Atlantic City in conjunction with Stock University. And we are back with Nick Underwood, aerospace engineer, NOAA Hurricane Hunter. Uh, Nick, let's kind of pick up where we left off at the end here, um, talking about your work outside of the office. Um, you know, during peak hurricane season there are storms what's the process to determine like who's going out and who's staying in the office or is it an all hands on deck situation we uh we have a watch bill set up so but at the beginning of the season uh management goes around and asks all right who has vacation when who uh you know just has other stuff going on in their life when when can you be on watch when do you need to be off watch and then uh from that they'll develop a, a schedule for the season and of course we'll inevitably end up deviating from that at some point because stuff pops up in everyone's lives. But we we have enough folks that we can backfill when someone has to step out for uh, a, a series of flights or something like that. Gotcha. Have you been to New Jersey in the plane, either for some kind of research or actually for any kind of tropical system? I think actually uh, for some flights around Hurricane Maria, in 2018 or 2017, mm -hmm. sorry, 2017, uh, some of our flight tracks on the Gulf Stream 4 took us up pretty far north off the coast of New Jersey. So I, I've not actually okay. flown there for missions, but we've been in the area. Okay. Did it look nice? Do you remember looking outside the window? The New Jersey? Uh, it's it's 45,000 feet and we were still pretty far offshore. So it's, <laughs> I don't know. It was even, a little I faint. I saw it was a little faint now. spec. Yeah. Understood. Um, I just want to talk about some recent storms that have hit here um, in New Jersey and, and your experience with them. So just start off with Elsa, uh, which was on July 9th here for us. Um, you know, flying, were you flying a mission for that? What was it like uh, with that storm? So we did a couple of missions. I was on our Gulf Stream 4 again for that system. And so that's our aircraft that is up at 45,000 feet around, of, around in front of and above the storm. And so the, those flights typically don't get too rough. Uh, typically the cloud tops don't reach up to our flight level. Uh, and, but the missions are still incredibly important because what we're really doing in that aircraft is sampling the environment around the storm. So is it gonna ingest some dry air? Uh, and we'll also sample the, um, the ridge out in the Atlantic. People hear about the ridge all the time. And that's the, the system that really determines where the storm is going to make its turn back out into the Atlantic. So if that ridge is stronger, it's going to drive that storm further west. If it's weaker, then the storm has a tendency to recurve back out into the ocean. And so those missions certainly don't get the same uh, fanfare and tend to not be as exciting as the missions on the P3, but they're just as important. Sure. And the ridge, just to elaborate a little bit, it's associated, you might hear a Bermuda high, uh, you know, you'll hear me talking about it. It's similar to that. It's a ridge that's in the Atlantic, runs from about Bermuda to the Azores. And, you know, to Nick's point, it helps to drive the direction of our hurricanes and tropical systems. Um, let's talk about Isaias, which was last year. Um, that was actually pretty impactful for us. Uh, we had our largest power outage in Superstorm Sandy with that. We had two tornadoes with that system. Um, it was actually unique, Nick, because... We actually had at the coast like less than a half inch of rain, but we did have winds that were gusting in the 60s and even 70s in a couple of places. So a little more impactful for us in New Jersey. Uh, what, what was your experience with that last year? Uh, so for Isa, yes, I was on one of our WP3Ds. We did a series of missions uh, out of Lakeland, Florida, which is where we're based. And we flew into that uh, storm up until it makes landfall. And that's the whole point of these aircraft is to get the radars and the sensing instruments that we have on land out 
over the ocean to where we can collect the data. And once the system makes landfall, there's really not much left for us to do uh, from, a, from a research perspective and from a reconnaissance perspective. But we did do a series of missions. It was uh, a relatively weak storm that sort of raked its way up the Eastern seaboard. Uh, but obviously even weaker storms can cause a lot of damage. And so people at home you know, shouldn't be brushing off if something is just a tropical storm or just a category one hurricane because they can still be very, very dangerous. <laughs> I'm laughing here because, you know, obviously you're seeing it all. So, you know, a high end tropical storm is, you know, nothing for you. But, you know, for us, you know, that's, that's usually what we're dealing with here when it comes to tropical systems. E even Sandy, even though it was technically a post tropical cyclone when it came here, that was a category one. It did bring, I mean, an unspeakable devastation here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're out in those, like those all time storms, those category five kind of storms, it, does the gravity of situation like ever get to you like oh my god like you know this is going towards x location and i'm here for it like you know what's just kind of that like on an emotional level i i think no matter how strong the storm is if we can tell that it's going to make landfall uh at a place that's you know where people live which is pretty much all along every coast these days uh, there's, there's that weight there of that what we're doing up in the air is really important and it matters to these good folks on the ground. And that helps motivate me and I'm sure for the rest of the crew as well to do the best job that we can up there. And I really felt, uh, uh, I really felt that the most of flying missions around Hurricane Maria in 2017. I was again on the Gulf Stream 4 and we were doing a mission just before it made landfall in Puerto Rico. And the most, the only thing that we can do up there is just collect data on these systems so we can understand where they're going and how strong they're going to be when they get there. There's nothing we can do to steer them or turn them around or dissipate them or anything. These are just these very powerful forces of nature. And I remember feeling that weight very heavily because all of the data points were showing that it was going to really just hit Puerto Rico very hard, which it did. Uh, and so for every system, whether it's big cat four, cat five storms, or even the weaker stuff, there's, there's that thing in the back of your mind that this is important for folks on the ground. Sure. Um, I'm going to try to segue this as best we can. I'm going to try to position ourselves in some lighter topics here. Um, we're going to talk about your Twitter account because that is actually how, you know, we came in contact and I reached out to you for this. You have you're over 18,000 followers as of last uh, count, and your content's very sticky. You know, people like to hear what you say. Um, you've been at it since 2008. So, you know, you've been pretty, but you've seen like every generation of Twitter here at this point. So, you know, how did you develop such a big following? And, and when did that really like, you know, was there a big increase at some point with people who were coming to you? Or was this a slow buildup over the past 13 years? Uh, so my, my joke about my Twitter account is that I've been on Twitter since the Bush administration, uh, which is true. <laughs> uh, which is factual. Yeah. But, uh, so it, it's really just gotten big over the last couple of years as I've gained notoriety of, you know, being in the job that I am and, and sort of being able to provide that uh, behind the scenes view of, of what we do. And it, it is my personal Twitter account, so it's not officially affiliated with NOAA or the federal government or anything, and I, I make that very clear always, uh, because even though I do share stuff from my job, pictures of storms and clouds and everything else, I also share things about my life and say, you know, hey, I'm playing this board game with some friends this weekend, I'll let you know how it is, or, you know, go Bolts, you know, because I live in Tampa now and a Tampa Bay Lightning fan, uh, and so it's City of Champions, Tampa Bay. Exactly, yeah, Tampa Bay. Yeah, Tampa Bay. Uh, but it's 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 really just become this huge thing, and I, I do my best to uh, for the folks who come for the weather stuff to get the content that they are there for. So I always are posting, you know, when we're going on flights and the pictures from the hurricanes and everything. But it's also still, you know, just my personal thing, and so I I, I don't I have no qualms with you know, sharing my uh, thoughts and opinions on things or just, you know, what's going on in my life. No, I mean, and, and you know what, like, when you talk about like, 
social media, right? Like, I think people want to see the full picture too, you know? So they get the, you know, serious Nick, Hey, I'm up here, you know, I'm up here in the plane or I'm working on this. And then, you know, talking about Champa Bay, I don't know, were you at the boat parades? Were you at any of these boat parades? They look awesome. I need to get down to Tampa next time they win something. I did not go to the boat parade. Uh, had it not been in a pandemic, I probably would have gone to the boat parade, but I'm still playing things pretty safe down here. So, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. I understand. I, I know Florida has been uh, having a rough go with the uh, COVID over the past couple of weeks over here mm-hmm. or over by you. Um, I want to go over some recent tweets that, that you had and uh, just, just a couple, I just want to follow up with some tweets that you had. So on August 4th, uh, you were pondering if the secretary of commerce would tell you to just stop. Uh, did that happen yet? It's not happened. Uh, that would be my nightmare. Uh, no. <laughs> so I, 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 like I said, I do my best to, to keep things professional. Uh, but I also know that I've, I've gained a very large following and people know that I work for Noah. And so I try to represent Noah the best I can in my unofficial capacity. But if the secretary of commerce were to come to me and say, stop, I would say, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, uh, no news is good news. I guess I, this one, but I, I think you do a very good job. I, like I said, in the beginning, I think you're bringing to light a lot of what you do and you're probably, I'm just saying this, honestly, you're probably inspiring someone out there to do what you're doing. So I think people appreciate that. I asked you on Twitter, I said, Hey, I want you uh, to give us your definition of North, South, and maybe Central Jersey. You said to me something along the lines of, I'm not going to research this because you, quote, wanted to keep it pure. So I have not seen it yet. So I am now going to look at the email you sent me. And oh, my God. (laughs) I've. I've never seen that before. Um, so I'm, you just start and then I'll just ask some questions afterwards. So just give me your, uh, just go I'll, and we'll, we'll talk. So, so as I said earlier, uh, so this, this map is correct uh, from, an, from an outside <laughs> independent source. I figured things relatively in the region of New York City probably constituted more North New Jersey. Yeah, okay. And then I figured... Uh, Pretty much the entire coastline that includes Atlantic City, uh, yeah. that stuff. We'll call right. that South Jersey. And then Central Jersey is just everything else. Uh, and what's nice is that it makes that nice sort of lightning bolt uh, shape. I which see that. I think is just an added bonus for that, for that, um, that division. The north part, I, I, under, I can see that. Like, I understand that. I just, I have a problem with you having Vineland here, which is like in the far Southern part of the state being Mm -hmm. central. And so is um, uh, Sussex County, which is in the Northwest corner of the state. So Mm -hmm. I I don't know like which way I have to turn the map to get the central there. I'm just, um, and you've been to New Jersey how many times? Uh, Twice, I think. Twice. Okay. Three three times if you count driving through it. Got it. Well, you know, maybe what we're going to do is we'll put this up um, before the episode drops and we'll see, we'll have people chime in. I, I appreciate this. This is very I, that's why I wanted the outsider perspective, because it was going to give us something we would never seen before. And you did so very nicely here. Happy to provide. Wonderful. Um, Nick, well, thank you so much on a serious level. Thank you so much for being here. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, tell us. Uh, well, tell people your Twitter handle account where they can follow you and anything else you want to add before we wrap up. Uh, it's, it's at the Astro Nick. Um, before we wrap up, be sure you follow the official NOAA accounts on Twitter, the Na- National Hurricane Center, the NOAA Hurricane Hunters, NOAA proper. Uh, be sure you're following those accounts for all kinds of important information, uh, whether it be about hurricanes or anything else that's going on. Uh, and also just that, our office, we're civil servants doing the best we can to keep people safe on the ground. And we're happy to do it. And we're going to continue to do it. Awesome. Well, Nick, thanks again for the time. We appreciate it. We're going to have a new episode for everybody here at the beginning of September, first Wednesday, September with New Jersey State Climatologist, my weather dad, my birthday buddy, Dave Robinson. We're going to recap the month of August. You can find all of our episodes on our website, pressofac.com. You can also go get this wherever you get your podcast. We thank Nick again for the time. Stay safe, everybody. We'll be back with you in September. Enjoy. This is the Something in the Air podcast.